Welcome back for the Halo 5 Breakdown. We'll waste no time and dive right in. Blue Team has gone AWOL. On Infinity, an understandably distressed Halsey reveals the source of the attacks on UNSC colonies, Cortana. She has accessed the Forerunner Domain, a galaxy-spanning network that allows her to activate whatever devices are causing the damage. Lasky, meanwhile, reveals what we just experienced. The Master Chief made contact with Cortana and has gone AWOL. As they continue discussion, Roland, who has been asking questions all the while, shoves himself into the conversation with a very important question. Why is Cortana the problem? Because she refused to die when she was supposed to? Now before we move on, I think it's important to address this line, as it's received a lot of flack in the community. Well, not the line itself, but the lack of a definitive answer. I must, however, defend that lack of a definitive answer. The question is put out there to make the player think. To answer it for us would defeat the purpose of the question, at least in my opinion. Now, we could easily debate all day as to whether we get a real answer by the end of the game, but the answer isn't really what you're meant to focus on. I've talked before about the journey being more important than the destination, and I think that applies to this situation. The question is what we should focus on, as there really is no right answer. And honestly, in my opinion, the rest of the game is the answer. But again, there's no right answer, so that's just me. Anyway, we cut to Fireteam Osiris, who is being reassigned to hunt down Blue Team. Buck and Locke exchange some nice banter, Buck reflecting on his days as an ODST when things were simple. When he asks how a group of Spartan 4s is expected to take down the legendary Blue Team, As politely. Locke reveals how. An armor restraint device, an interesting answer, and one that ties in nicely to the Hunt the Signal ARG. The ARG story followed a group of AIs trying to find weaknesses in Mjolnir systems, seemingly for this purpose. The timelines are a bit iffy, but for those who participated, this scene was likely a nice payoff for those who put the work in. It was for me, anyhow. Although, I do have to say, why does Locke only have one? I can't imagine Blue Team just giving up because one of them is a mobile, even if that one is John. Nothing? No? Okay. So anyway, Buck makes the famous remark from the trailers. Every other Spartan, every soldier, when they hear about this, they're gonna hate us. To which Locke responds, You're not the only one here because of him. And here's where I have to start ripping into things. What does this line even mean? Why does it exist? Neither Buck nor John joined the Spartans because of the Master Chief. Locke was motivated because of the sacrifice of Randall Aiken, and Buck was motivated by, at his own admission, Sarah Palmer. I'm oversimplifying things here, but you get the gist. The Master Chief had no direct, and little if any indirect, effect on Buck and Locke's decision to join the Spartan branch. Interesting, though, is that this line would make a lot more sense if Buck roles had been filled by Gabriel Thorne, one of the original members of Osiris during Halo 5's development early on. Thorne was indeed motivated by the heroism of the Master Chief, and the bonus materials from Halo 4's limited edition make this very clear, if it wasn't clear enough in Spartan Ops. Games are often rewritten a lot during development, and parts of old scripts can find their way into the final product, for one reason or another. I can only imagine this line, possibly even this whole exchange, as being one of those instances. Moving forward, Osiris deploys to Meridian, a once-glassed UNSC colony that is slowly being mined by a company called Liang Dortmund. In these levels, Spartan Tanaka really gets to shine as a character. Through her, we get bits of history on Meridian and Tanaka, along with an idea of the post-war climate between the UEG and her colonies. And as demonstrated in Hunt the Truth, it ain't good. On the way to the moon's surface, Osiris notices that Promethean forces are already present and engaging local defenses. They also have their first encounter with the AI known as Governor Sloan. Upon reaching the surface, they clear out the base and make their way towards a Meridian station. Along the way, they are again contacted by Sloan. As Osiris helps clear out Promethean forces and saving the colonists, Sloan starts to warm up, eventually agreeing to cooperate. Once inside Meridian Station, Locke informs Sloan of their hunt for another Spartan fire team. Though Sloan professes no knowledge of the other Spartans, he allows Osiris to take a look around and see if they find anything. By talking to the people, Osiris discovers that a UNSC ship was recently spotted near Apogee Station, a station that also saw recent Promethean activity. Once they talk it over with Sloan, he offers them a pelican to make the trip to Apogee, and Osiris departs. Now before we move on, let's talk about the level Meridian Station. It's the first of three stop-and-look levels, for lack of a better phrase, one of many points of controversy in Halo 5. Now admittedly, when I first played through, I was confused, and to a degree, actually pissed that such a thing would 
ever exist in a Halo game. Why would you ever want to cut the action full stop in a goddamn shooter? However, later sections and subsequent playthroughs really changed my mind. We'll talk a little bit more on why when we get to Sunk Helios, but overall, I came to love these sections. Looking around, discovering little bits of hidden dialogue and little easter eggs, hints at events yet to come. One of my favorite sections in Meridian is seeing a scientist looking over the remains of a Promethean knight. Now, I'm kind of curious as to how they got those remains, since normally when a knight is, for lack of a better word, killed, they disintegrate completely, but it's cool regardless. I will say, however, that Meridian Station is probably the least interesting of these stop and look sections. The stuff that's here is nice, but it pales in comparison to later sections and really does bring the story to a halt, albeit briefly. Anyway, once at Apogee Station, Osiris goes to work clearing out the local Promethean forces and investigating the UNSC Prowler that Blue Team originally stole from Argent Moon. From there, Osiris traces Blue Team into the nearby mine, much to Sloane's apprehension. Interestingly, as Osiris enters, Buck notes that there doesn't seem to be any sign of Blue Team having to engage Prometheans, implying that the Prometheans never attacked them. Of course, we have a pretty good idea as to why. Once inside the mine, it isn't long before the team encounters a large Forerunner site, and Tanaka has a revelation. Not only did Blue Team not have to deal with the Prometheans, they didn't have to deal with Governor Sloan. As the Spartans enter the site, they encounter the boss that refuses to die, the Warden Eternal. The Warden reveals that the site is called a Guardian Sanctuary, and that he stands in service to Cortana, and that, while Blue Team was allowed to pass, Osiris would not be so lucky. Personally, I found it very interesting that the Warden says regretfully during this first exchange. It's very different from the attitude he has in later levels, although by then he's probably as sick of fighting the same enemies as we are. Anyway, after disposing of the Warden, Osiris is fully able to track down Blue Team. Chasing them through the site, Locke is briefly separated from Osiris and immediately finds himself confronting Blue Team. He orders them to halt and, much I think to everyone's amusement, they more or less blow him off. As Osiris shows up and Chief is about to leave, Locke orders him to stand down, noting that Cortana is Osiris' responsibility. The Chief, of course, disagrees. Now, a lot has been said about this fight, good and bad, and I have to say, both sides have valid points. Personally, I think it's... pretty good? The way the Chief snatches the gun from Locke, the music, the lighting, all perfect. Of course, as the fight goes on, it kinda goes downhill. The very end is, as many have said, almost like two drunks fighting rather than two Spartans. I don't know that I'd go that far, but I can't outright say that such criticisms are wrong. For me personally, the problem starts with Osiris. They are present and yet do nothing. And don't say they couldn't get to him, as not only are the Spartans in multiplayer able to close much greater distances, but Osiris shows off some pretty spectacular moves when they have to escape and throughout the game in general. The fact that they never intervene is nonsensical, to put it lightly. Very lightly. The other big problem is that the fight just feels slow and it doesn't have any weight to it, physically speaking. I mean, we're talking about Spartans here, and yet the fight looks like it's between two normal dudes. The moves are slow, the hits have no weight behind them, most of the time anyway. I still enjoy watching the fight, but I think it could have been so much more. And once again, I have to disagree with the idea of making the chief fight in-game, an idea I've seen thrown around a few times. Unless we're talking about a series of what would basically be quick time events, I can't imagine it being a very interesting fight, especially since you, as the player, would have to lose for the sake of the plot. It could possibly be interesting the first time around, but any subsequent playthrough would be tedious at best. So, after incapacitating Locke, the Chief escapes into the Guardian. Osiris finally moves forward, releasing Locke, but finds that the way they came in is now gone. Luckily, it seems that escaping via Blue Team's entrance is still an option. Once on the surface, Osiris makes for the space elevator for their pelican. They briefly consider calling it in, but with all the phaetons in the air, it's a bit too risky. As the Spartans fight their way through more Prometheans, they realize that Sloane had to know about the Guardian and Cortana. When they confront him, he admits that she gave him a warning, and then departs himself. Osiris, once on the elevator, clears out wave after wave of Prometheans. As they near the top, one of the most haunting moments in the game occurs. A call comes through on the radio a woman who had just made it to Meridian Station, only to find it abandoned. Hello? Can anyone hear me? I'm at Meridian Station. Everyone's dead. Governor Sloan isn't here. I... I... Please. 
Is there anyone left here but me? Even now, after so many playthroughs, after hearing it so many times, it still gets to me. Not long after, the elevator is hit by a pulse from the Guardian, forcing Osiris to climb the rest of the way. When the elevator is about to collapse, Locke risks the autopilot, and Osiris barely makes it to their pelican, Locke himself having to dive for it in what I assume is meant as a parallel to the chief diving after the liches in Halo 4. As the pelican leaves, so does the Guardian, carrying Blue Team to parts unknown. On board Infinity, we learn that five more attacks have occurred following Meridian. Halsey, meanwhile, has found a Guardian that has not yet been activated, possibly allowing for Osiris to pursue Blue Team and Cortana. The problem? It's on Sanghelios. Sanghelios is off limits. Brass wants nothing to do with the Arbiter's War. Luckily, Roland has a brilliant idea. He captured a set of coordinates from Meridian, which could then be fed into the Sanghelios Guardian. With no other options, Lasky goes to make the arrangements, ending our coverage of Meridian. As you can see, Meridian is certainly a mixed bag for Halo 5. On the bright side, it contains some great dialogue, notably from Buck and Tanaka. Tanaka, of course, demonstrates her knowledge of post-war UEG colony relations, while revealing bits of her backstory and exactly what Liang Dormund hopes to gain from the operation on Meridian. Buck's dialogue, meanwhile, contains tons of Easter eggs for lore fans, brief mentions of Veronica, comparing the loss of Meridian to the loss of New Alexandria. He's also great comic relief. On the intel side, there is a ton. One set of intel found throughout the levels is a brief history of Meridian herself, from the founding to the fall. It seems the moon has always been a hotbed for insurrectionist or similar activity. Also scattered about are hints not only at the Guardian that rests just below for much of this section, but also indications of how a private company like Liang Dortmund is able to procure a tank, indications of Mjolnir innovations making their way to the private sector, team to rehabilitate a glass planet means accounting for its extreme conditions. Uniforms have to deal with extreme cold surface temps, as well as the heat generated by drills. Liang Dortmund set us up with some UNSC-developed tech, gel layer they call it. Goes on under your clothes and keeps temperatures steady. This stuff is magic. And the horrors and beauty left in the wake of a glass colony. My favorite on this subject comes from a former Meridian resident who goes from seeing the glass as a constant reminder of what was lost to what Meridian could one day become. I've said it before and I'll say it again, the intel items in Halo 5 are easily the highlight of the game. There was a lot of discussion and even some outcry from fans when we first discovered that terminals as we came to know them since Halo CEA would be absent in Halo 5, but I think the trade-off is more than worth it. Hell, I'd go so far as to say that I kind of prefer intel over the terminals. Kind of. Both have advantages and disadvantages. But that wraps up Meridian. Next up, we'll be talking Genesis, the Domain, and most importantly, Blue Team. And that will include some of the Halo 5 advertising material. Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Canon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.